Hello and welcome back to this second presentation. This presentation, which will be about 12 minutes long, has the goal of digging a little bit deeper into race and racism in the field of music education. Music was included formally as a curricular subject in schools for the first time in 1838 in Boston. Singing teacher Lowell Mason led this effort, arguing that every child could and should learn music, and he justified its inclusion in the curriculum because of, one, its moral benefits. The ancient Greek philosopher Plato was one of the first to, to say that music can bring about good and virtuous, kindly feelings and is worthy of study for that reason. Mason also emphasized music's physical benefits making music exercises the lungs and other vital organs. He also, he also promoted the idea that music was intellectually stimulating, especially the memorization and comparison and attention needed to participate in music ensembles. He was successful in his effort to promote music, music education and, and was able to win over the school board in his belief in promoting the belief that music education is for the masses and not just the talented few, which was the view kind of held in, in the country to that point. So while Mason believed that every child should learn music, he also promoted the use of European songs in American schools. In fact, he was vehemently opposed to the use of folk music and fuguing tunes that were emerging from United States composers who weren't writing music in the style of their European predecessors. He judged American folk music to be crude and unsophisticated. Even after the Civil War and the emancipation of the slaves, the music of Europe, be it concert music or folk music, was the only music deemed worthy of study. So the music of Beethoven, Brahms, and Mozart, and Mendelssohn took a central place. Music emerging from African-American communities, such as spirituals and field hollers and blues, was not deemed worthy of study. During the first 100 years of music in U.S. schools, the repertoire that was being studied and sung was not the only um, aspect of music education where there were emphatic views. How the music was taught, uh, the pedagogical sequencing, was also debated. Some argued for relying on rote learning, that is, hearing the music modeled by the leader and students replicating what they heard, which would allow them to develop their oral skills, A-U-R-A-L, that kind of oral skills. Others argued for learning to read music that was on the page, and this would give students access to centuries of notated music, mostly from Europe, without having to rely on another person to teach them how it goes. Although students would benefit uh, immensely from developing both rote and note skills, the field of music education veered strongly toward note learning at the expense of developing oral skills and did not include music that emerged from cultures that emphasized an oral transmission of information, oral in that case being O-R-A-L. And if you remember back to week one of this course, Dr. McComb talked about the emphasis on the written word in the field of history and how America has valued the written word and that oral traditions are at a disadvantage. The same is true with regard to music education during its first hundred years in this country. And let's remember, we're only talking about schools where music was actually offered as a subject. During the first half of the 20th century, most schools were racially segregated, and many students of color attended schools that did not have access to music courses in the curriculum. Starting in the 1900s, technological advances, including the Victor Victrola talking machine, pictured there in the lower left-hand corner of the screen, made it possible to listen to recorded music. And even though a wide variety of musical styles were now available for listening in the classroom, including music from around the world and American jazz, blues, and folk, 
It was the European masterworks that still dominated the curriculum. Musical cultures from non-European backgrounds were viewed as exotic. Even though music emerging from established African-American communities such as the music of Scott Joplin and Ragtime, Jelly Roll Morton, Bessie Smith, Louis Armstrong, and Fletcher Henderson, this music was very sophisticated and gaining widespread spread interest and fan bases among black and white audiences alike, yet it remained off-limits for curricular study in the first half of the 20th century. Same with Duke Ellington a little bit later, and Charlie Parker, and Mahalia Jackson, Dizzy Gillespie, Miles Davis, all immensely popular, but their music was forbidden on the whole in music education and in music classrooms to this point. And this exclusion was not limited to African-American contributions. Music emerging from a growing Mexican-American population, including corridos and rancheras, and in New York City, Puerto Rican folk music, and indigenous Native American music, all were dismissed as being somehow primitive and simple and not as refined or civilized as the Western art music. In fact, even when the, the Czech composer Antonin Dvorak considered by many to be one of the greats at the time, when he visited the United States in the late 1800s and publicly lauded and showed great reverence for African-American spirituals, leaders in American music education were not convinced, were not persuaded to deem this style of music, this genre of music, as worthy of study in American schools. One hundred years ago, this year, is when some things began to change about this attitude. So in 1922, the Fisk Jubilee Singers, which is recognized as the first touring collegiate choir in this country, they performed at the Music Supervisors National Conference. This was the primary professional organization for music educators. It was later renamed MENC, Music Educators National Conference, and is now called NAFME, National Association for Music Education. For many in attendance, this was the, their first exposure to, to uh, African American spirituals, and the experience of hearing this music was so impactful that choirs from across the country slowly began to program program spirituals in their repertory. However, other African-American music was still deemed inappropriate for school. Jazz, for instance, was uh, linked and associated with saloons and immor immorality. Gospel was deemed too religious for public schools. Yet it should be mentioned that the cantatas and masses of, by the likes of Bach, Haydn, and Schubert, European composers, did not receive the designation, so it sure seems like there was a double standard. If that was the argument for not including gospel music. More progress was made in 1967. In the concluding years of the modern civil rights movement, the Tanglewood Symposium occurred. This is a conference of musicians, educators, and corporate leaders, and they made the following resolution. Quote, Music of all periods, styles, forms, and cultures belongs in the curriculum. The musical repertoire should be expanded to involve music of our time in its rich variety, including currently popular teenage music and avant-garde music, American folk music, and the music of other cultures. So now, 130 years later, after Lowell Mason's work and and promoting of the ideas that only Western, American, Western European music should be performed in schools. The field of music education was finally beginning to formally acknowledge the importance of non-Western European cultures. Musical diversity was gradually taking hold. High school and middle school jazz bands sprung up throughout the country. Music appreciation classes began including music beyond the Western European canon, and choral and instrumental ensembles began to diversify the repertoire. Nonetheless, evidence of the belief that Western European art music and style of singing is superior to others is still intact today. 
in many of our schools and religious institutions. The effort to center non-Western European music is still certainly a work in progress. So moreover, where are we today? So while um, it's a work in progress and there is more music that is emerging from non-Western cultures that has been um, included in music education settings, it's been normalized and to some degree is expected, there are still many challenges. Tokenism, for instance, exists and that there's still a mindset among many in my field that we simply program an African-American spiritual at the end of every concert. A, because it gets the crowd on their feet, because it's exciting and enthusiastic and emotional, and B, checks the, the quote-unquote diversity box. Cultural appropriation comes into play when ensembles program and sing music without the due diligence of understanding the context from where the music emerges. An example would be a predominantly white choir singing spirituals with choreography and smiling and jazz hands without any mention of the fact that the music emerged from a people who were enslaved and the music is born out of trauma and pain. And as this course has pointed out without a doubt, we as a country have not yet overcome the injustice that began in 1619 when the first Africans arrived on North American soil and were enslaved. And finally, representation. The majority of music educators and all educators are white, female, and only speak English. Meanwhile, students attending U.S. schools are increasingly diverse in terms of ethnicity, race, language, and religion. And the lack of representation remains a barrier. So it's my hope that these two lectures that you've uh, heard and listen to and watch will help you get more meaning from the assigned readings and videos and Thursday's live stream webinar. Uh, the webinar will also include choral director and scholar Nicole Davis. She is a PhD student at Florida State University. And she recently presented on topics related to this week's theme at an American Choral Directors Association conference in Chicago. She'll offer, I guarantee, she'll offer much insight and important contributions to this conversation forward to seeing you and hearing from you on Thursday. Thank you.